Well, I think we'll get started now. So hi, everyone. Um, welcome to MIT Press Live, a new virtual event series brought to you. I'm the Digital Man Marketing Manager at the MIT Press, and I will be your host for the series. Today, we're speaking with Jonathan Haber, author of Critical Thinking, the 50th book of the MIT Press Essential Knowledge Series, which just so happens to be out today. Hey, Jonathan, how's it going? Uh, powering through. How are you doing? Great. Um, so, you know, to get us started, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure. Um, I am an educational uh, research and consultant who has worked in both K-12 and higher education uh, with a background in assessment and curriculum design and a particular obsession with critical thinking education. Great. Um, so tell us more about your book, Critical Thinking. Uh, sure. So um, this is actually my second book with uh, MIT Press. Uh, the first book was on massive open online courses, or MOOCs, um, that I wrote after taking 32 of them in 12 months as part of a sort of overwrought project called uh, Degree of Freedom. Um, this is also my second book on critical thinking. The first one is called Critical Voter, which used election politics to teach critical thinking skills. Uh, the new book, kind of in the spirit of the MIT Essential series, focuses on helping readers get to the bottom of what critical thinking is, uh, what it consists of, and what to do to increase the amount of it in the world. And so what inspired this book? Why did you choose critical thinking as a subject? Well, you know, even before the sort of current um, kind of mega crisis that we're all kind of living through right now, I was seeing all kinds of other crises from dis disintegration of civil politics to economic and environmental catastrophes. And they all kind of seem to be originating from failures to think critically about the most important issues that face us as a, as a society and as a, as a species. Um, well, I've written critical thinking curricula, kind of how to do it. It seems like efforts to Stop generally- sitting on my left. Get a chair and sit next to me, sweetheart. Um, especially how to teach students to think away. critically have kind of stalled. So I, I wanted to write a book that would sort of tackle what I felt were three myths that kept us from moving critical thinking from aspirations to reality. Great. Uh, so kind of uh, just uh, explaining, you know, as covered in the book, what are those three myths? Um, the, you know, the first one is, uh, the three myths really are, one, that we don't have a definition for critical thinking. We don't know what it is. This often comes up in the phrase of, you know, we can't teach it until we know what it is. Uh, that's myth number one. A second is that we don't know how to teach it or if it even can be taught. And a third myth is that we have no way of evaluating it, testing it, if student critical thinking skills are improving. So just sort of running through, you know, starting with what is critical thinking. Um, there are, in fact, a number of, of definitions of critical thinking that critical thinking researchers have, have come up with over the years, uh, different wording for the phrase. And when, pe when people knew I was writing this book, there was sort of, you know, a lot of questions. Oh, are you going to decide which one is right? Or are you going to synthesize all these and come up with a sort of, you know, uh, uh, agreed upon definition, agreed upon wording we can all sort of agree to. And it's, but instead I took a genealogical approach to the subject because, you know, critical thinking, there's this notion of where did the concept come from? Where did the idea come from that there's this unique form of thinking distinct from intelligence and wisdom that we would call critical? And, and what I learned from sort of delving into the origins of critical thinking is that, you know, first of all, it draws upon many different disciplines going back to philosophy, particularly the ancient philosophy of, of Aristotle, who sort of codified logic and rhetoric, which as we'll talk about components and critical thinking is a major part of, of, of what came to be critical thinking, but also science, particularly the earliest development of sort of scientific uh, methodologies. And then you've got fields like psychology, education, and uh, most recently sort of modern cognitive science, how the brain works. I think one researcher pointed out that philosophy and science sort of, of tell us how we should think, how to perfect our thinking, psychology, education, cognitive science, tell us how we actually do think. And so those sort of fused together kind of, of came to sort of what I describe as an origin point for critical thinking. And critical thinking actually has an origin, we could date it to a particular point in time, 1910, with the uh, writing of the book, How We Think by John Dewey, 
one of the most important intellectuals of the 20th, 20th century, who wrote a book um, called How We Think, where he defined a concept of reflective thinking, which consists of active, persistent, and careful a presentation of any belief or supposed form of knowledge in the light of the grounds which support it and the further conclusions which it tends. This is the first definition of what came to be called critical thinking and all other definitions that have come since then have sort of been in dialogue. And what I kind of propose in the book is really sort of summed up with a, in a lot of the research is that critical thinking is really sort of three components or there, there's many elements to critical thinking but there's three parts of, of, of how those components are applied. One is knowledge, Another is skills, another is disposition. So, for instance, you need knowledge of, for instance, some form of logic, but you also have to be able to put that, that, that to use. So you need the skills of applying logic to real world situations. And then you also need the disposition, the willingness to think logically versus thinking emotionally or in some other unproductive, unproductive way. Okay, so that's the sort of consensus, a consensus model. It's not a consensus wording, but it's enough to move forward. It's enough to move forward with a sort of critical thinking project, which gets us to the next point of teaching critical thinking skills. And again, um, you know, critical thinking, the component, components of critical thinking have been taught for centuries, actually millennia. If you think about logic, that's been taught for close to 2,500 years. In fact, it was one of the cornerstone subjects of being a, an educated person. And, and modern education has been built around different subjects, right? In the US, we have ELA, language skills, but then also math, science, social studies. That's become fairly universal as a set of sort of core subjects around the world. Um, so there's a question of, can we teach critical thinking as part of the current curriculum, or are we required to sort of tear everything down and start over? And um, to sort of answer that, there, there was work of a critical thinking researcher uh, named Robert Ennis, who 1989 proposed three ways critical thinking can be taught. Uh, one is a, gen is a general approach, three approaches. One is a general approach, which is like a standalone course just on teaching critical thinking principles. This is largely how we teach critical thinking in colleges in the US. There's often a standalone critical thinking course that draws from many different disciplines, for examples. Uh, then you can also teach by immersion. This is largely how we do it in sort of young, lower grades, K-12, but also to a certain extent in college. And this is what you have when smart teachers are teaching complex material and are dedicated to improving their kids' critical thinking skills, which most of them are. Most uh, teachers profess that it's their highest priority, but they do not teach critical thinking skills explicitly. Instead, the assumption is critical thinking comes along for the ride when uh, complex subjects are taught, taught taught well. And it turns out general and immersion are not the best ways to teach critical thinking. Some of the research has done since and has proposed this, these three approaches, um, seems to point that a, an approach called infusion, where you still integrate critical thinking content into subject matter, but you do it explicitly. The example I like to use is, you know, when a math teacher, often the first time students are exposed to um, deductive logic, which is a key critical thinking skill is in math class when they're taught uh, geometric proof. But how many math teachers stop and say, by the way, that was an example of deductive logic. Here's what that is. Here's how you can apply it to other subjects. So that's an example of explicit instruction. And it turns out if we could start folding more explicit instruction, into the teaching of existing courses, that means we don't have to tear apart the existing curriculum. We just have to use different techniques in order for teachers to do what they already claim to want to do, which is improve student critical thinking ability. So, so that, that's the sort of teaching. I think a third subject, which I don't have a slide for, but it's talked about more in the book, is can critical thinking be assessed? And um, you know, the book draws on sort of 25 plus years experience I have in testing and really points out there, there are already many professionally designed validated exams for teaching critical thinking skills. Tests like the Watson Glazer, the California Critical Thinking Skills Test, the CLA Plus, but also professors who teach critical thinking courses. And there's many hundreds if not thousands of them or, or professors who teach logic courses. They've all developed assessments for teaching these skills. And K-12 teachers teach higher thinking skills all the time, you know, usually through essays or other sorts of artifacts. So I, th I think the main point is 
we, it may be difficult to come up with a single universal test that we can use in all situations to test critical thinking skills, but such a thing might not really be necessary for the critical thinking project to go forward. I guess there's any questions on just the sort of three myths of critical thinking? Hi, so we have um, one question from the audience. Um, Marnie Landon asked, are there any recommended online courses to learn critical thinking skills and acquire the knowledge necessary? Uh, there's um, a, a couple of good um, kind of uh, podcasts, uh, Kevin DeLaPlante's sort of Critical Thinker Academy, which I think is also available on YouTube. He's also been developing a sort of program called Argument Ninja, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, a, a project I mentioned before, Critical Voter, um, you know, as I'll describe a little bit, I've been sort of, of updating that and will be using that to teach my son critical thinking skills in a way that other people can follow along. There's also a massive open course um, from Coursera from Duke University on uh, kind of critical thinking, logical reasoning. So I would sort of, of do some Googling, but you may want to kind of look into the sort of edX Coursera MOOCs as well as sort of kind of Googling uh, critical thinking course, but they are out there. Okay, great. Another question. Did you encounter any good examples of how to teach slash encourage critical thinking dispositions in students? Uh, this is a, uh, you know, I'll sort of get into sort of dispositions towards the ends, but these are, these are challenging because this is, in a way, this is sort of uh, character or morals education. Uh, these are the intellectual virtues you're teaching, uh, teaching people to be open-minded, teaching people to uh, be charitable towards the opinions of others. And there's techniques for doing this, you know, a popular one in class is you propose a debate topic and people pick sides, but then you have them switch, you, you force them to debate an opinion that they don't uh, initially agree with. That's a, that's a popular technique. There's other ways of doing it. I would say, you know, um, kind of cultivating those virtues is something, intellectual virtues, it's something that sort of is gonna go, gonna need to go beyond the classroom because if students show up at a critical thinking course or school with sort of hardened biases in place, from you know, from friends, from home, it's gonna be very hard to unshake those. So, but school can be a place for it. But I'd say you know, like like other virtues, they're ones that uh, need to be practiced in all aspects of life. And um, one last question before we move on. If anyone else has questions, we can ask them at the end. Um, is the immersion model suitable for all subjects, including say art history? Or is it best suited for philosophy, science, and other subjects that emphasize deductive reasoning? I presume is the last word there. So, uh, well, first, it's it's the inf it's the infusion method that um, I'm re recommending. I'll pop that slide back up again. Infusion is where you teach critical thinking skills and explicitly. Um, immersion is where it's sort of taught implicitly, and that's you know of not the most effective way, like that, that turns out to be the least effective way to teach it. But um, yeah, in any subject, it can be folded in, including sort of, of creative subjects. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of the work I've done since the book was put to bed is in an area what are called high leverage critical thinking practices. It's, it's modeled after high leverage practices by a, a famous educator called Deborah Ball who worked in math education. But as it turns out, there's certain subjects that um, like the math geometric proof I mentioned that lend themselves to teaching a particular critical thinking skills. If you're teaching English, for example, it's when you're teaching sort of, of argumentative writing um, when you're teaching science, you can talk about sort of controlling for biases, how the scientific method controls for confirmation bias, but it could certainly be applied to art, right? I think, you know, there's a, a notion that, um, you know, uh, which we'll have an example shortly, that um, everything that is not factual is an opinion, but in fact, that, that's, that's not true. There are reasons to believe something, and there's reasons to believe uh, why something is beautiful, for example, or the aesthetic, uh, aesthetic arguments to be made. So all these can benefit from using the elements in the critical thinkers toolkit, um, not just philosophy. In fact, you know, really, I can't think of a single subject uh, or aspect of life where these tools are not useful. Great. Well, thanks for answering those questions. I guess we should move on to the next slide. We'll have more opportunities for questions along the way.
Absolutely, yeah, no, and, and thank you for those uh, really thoughtful questions. I'm looking forward to more of them. So, um, you know, here we want to get into, you know, really the sort of, of second big chapter in the book covers this, but, you know, what are the components of critical thinking? Because uh, there are a discrete set of elements that need to be mastered uh, to be a critical thinker. And I, I list them here. You know, one of them, I, I usually start out by referring to these as structured thinking, even though generally that would involve mastering some form of logic. Uh, the reason I don't sort of lead with the word logic is because there are many different forms of logics. There are, um, you know, there's formal logic, there's informal logic, those are categories. You have symbol symbolic logic. Um, there are graphical ways of representing sort of statements logically, uh, Toulmin diagrams, um, a group here in um, Boston called Thinker Analytics works with argument maps. Someone was asking before about a critical thinking course. That's a good way for younger learners to learn how to visualize arguments. Okay, so, you know, one of the things one needs is to understand a system of logic well enough to apply it to real world situations. That doesn't mean you need to major in logic and philosophy. These are all subjects that uh, anyone, any teacher, any student can master enough logic to structure their thinking. So the only, the only option that's not on the table is leaving your thinking unorganized. Okay, a second skill is language skills, um, that many of the things we're gonna need to think critically about are expressed in language. They're the editorial that we read, they're the political speech we listen to, they're the debate we're having with a friend or loved one. These are all using kind of real world language, right? We're not machines talking in, in, in machine code. Okay, so that, though that real world language has to be reduced um, and translated into clear, unambiguous statements you know, that can be worked into a logical structure. That structure is called an argument. And with argumentation, you need to be able to apply logical rules to structured statements to determine, is an argument any good? Is it strong or weak? Uh, often to do that, you need to have some background knowledge. You need to sort of um, know about a subject matter, as I often describe, is you can't think critically about a subject if you don't know what you're talking about, if you kind of uh, don't understand uh, sort of a drama, kind of, of having an argument about sort of Shakespeare, who wrote Shakespeare is sort of pointless. If you don't know the difference between Sunni and Shia Islam, it's hard to have a, a discussion about the Middle East. So any debates that sort of mastering critical thinking skills come at the expense of content is a false dichotomy, right? You, you need your background knowledge, you need content knowledge in order to think critically. And it turns out thinking critically about content helps you internalize it much better. Um, I have a, a category called persuasive communication, sometimes referred to as rhetoric. This is the language one can use to make your statements, your speeches, your arguments more powerful um, and convincing. The reason I include it is often some of the language you have to sort of like kind of uh, peer through in order to get to sort of the logic underneath it is rhetoric that uh, kind of needs to be either sort of identified, in some cases uh, discarded, um, in order to get to the sort of logical core of an argument. But also, if you have created a sort of logically strong argument, if you can enhance it with some persuasive communication techniques, then you can make it not just convincing, but compelling. So I like to include some of the rhetorical arts into the, the kind of menu of critical thinking skills. And then finally, someone asked before about sort of dispositions, and I'd say many of those critical thinking dispositions um, uh, charitability, open-mindedness. These are designed to control for biases that we as human beings have wired into us, right? We are wired for confirmation bias. We're wired to want to believe facts that, that uh, uh, reinforce what we already believe. We're wired to reject things that uh, contradict what we already want to believe. Okay, so we need to sort of, we can't eliminate those. They're part of the human makeup, but we can understand them, identify them, and control for them when need be, when we're sort of engaging in a critical thinking exercise. So those are the pieces, those are the components. They're sort of, of, turn out to be relatively easy to understand. I think with a critical voter project, I found I could sort of teach people these particular skills in, in eight to 10 hours, but they do take kind of, a, a, if not a lifetime, a long time to master, since the skills component, you really have to kind of put them to work. And uh, any questions about the sort of pieces of, of, um, of critical thinking? So we have one very long but very relevant question. 
um, someone who has a background in philosophy is asking if there is a value in a philosophy curriculum for K-12 schools, and if so, what do you think the challenges are of getting philosophy in, the, in those schools? Yeah, I mean, for many, many years, there's um, been kind of programs for uh, philosophy, uh, bringing philosophy into K-12 schools. So just, you know, um, recently, my, my kind of wife who works for UMass found that she had in the archives, a group in the 70s that was sort of working on this. Um, there's groups of, of, I was just at the APA, the American Philosoph Philosophical Association, where there's whole kind of, of um, programs dedicated to philosophy in K through 12 education. Often it's um, kind of taking part through things like, uh, integrated into things like um, debate or ethics bowl is a very popular area where philosophers are working with high school uh, teachers to bring uh, philosophy to high schoolers. You've got um, the P4C project, I think P4, I'll think of it as what the, what the, the uh, last letter for, but that was a program in the UK where they actually systematically taught philosophy to very young learners in elementary school grades. And um, they would have real philosophical debates in class. And that was done sort of systematically, you know, systematically studied. What it turned out is kids who went through that program did, be did better in all their subjects, including uh, language, English, mathematics, uh, which to a certain extent makes sense because you know, philosophy is really um, about organizing your thinking, as I was talking about in the context of critical thinking. So I think, you know, it's it's a terrific idea. I think one thing um, philosophers are getting involved with and could getting involved could get involved with is sort of bringing some of the sort of techniques, the the, the philosophers' toolkit. I like to describe them, uh, kind of logic, the the components of critical thinking that really derive from the philosophical tradition, helping teachers uh, kind of bring that into their curriculum. I think that's a terrific role. So um, yeah, I think philosophy is, is you know, certainly already playing a role because critical thinking is very bound up with its kind of origin point in, in, in Aristotle. So you, you just got a ton of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll allow a couple right now and then we may save some for others. I'm going to start with the most relevant to the last question. Mm -hmm. um, someone added that P4C is philosophy for children. That's but, it, thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. I have teenagers, <laughs> so I've got C stands for it. <laughs> um, so that one might be helpful. And then someone else asked, and this is a little bit earlier, so apologies if it was asked before, um, but someone else asked, are there any recommended online courses to learn critical thinking skills and acquire the knowledge? Oh, I think someone did ask something similar, okay. so I'll just... Uh, I just yeah. want to make sure. I think I forgot yeah. to get rid of it. Um, mm -hmm. And then that person asked another question. Can you please speak a little bit more specifically about strategies for controlling the biases? Uh, at, sure. Um, you know, the I think, you know, to a certain extent, a lot of this is personal, that, you know, the biases we have you know, tend to be around things we believe more, most strongly, right? And often these are around political opinions, you know, um, um, matters of, of faith, matters of identity. So I think, you know, first of all, we need to identify that when a subject is going to um, kind of, of cross one of these things that we, that are really an important part of our identity, we should be particularly aware that um, we may be subject to sort of biased reasoning. You know, so if you've got strong political opinions, which, you know, uh, is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, I should sort of, I'll, I'll kind of talk about later that that's not unreasonable to have strong beliefs, but we, you should be particularly aware when you are reading or especially discussing or having a debate with somebody who does not share those opinions, right? There's a whole range of possibility, anything from somebody is saying something you disagree with, but they have a valid point, uh, maybe there could be some sort of constructive um, dialogue between between you, whereas someone is just spouting poppycock and you could ignore them because whatever they're saying is nonsense, right? You know, there's a tendency to kind of, of 
assume anything when you're in biased reasoning, there would be a tendency to assume anything you disagree with falls into the sort of poppycock uh, kind of, of region, when in fact it might be a reasonable disagreement. So I'd say that's probably the key area is um, keeping an open mind, especially about the things that, um, that you believe most strongly. Now, this doesn't mean you have to be so open-minded your brain falls out, right? One doesn't have to accept crank race theories or perpetual motion machines. Uh, but, you know, it does mean you have to assume everybody who disagrees you, with you is in that category. So I'd say that's probably the most important one. Okay, great. So do you have any examples of critical thinking uh, or any of the things you've been talking about so far? Uh, just so happened to have one. And, um, you know, I wanted to use one that will show several of these sort of principles uh, in action. Um, so I, I, I tried to pick a statement. This is, you know, um, uh, not any news source. This is just a statement that probably some of us have heard something like it, or if we haven't, we will, uh, especially if we're going to be holed up for several more weeks or even longer at home. So, but it, this is an argument, but it's, it's um, something that's expressed, you know, in the kind of everyday language we hear all the time, okay? And I'll quote it, we've been holed up in the house for a month, going stir crazy, and the number of deaths from coronavirus keeps going up. Clearly social distancing isn't working, okay? So this is, there's some emotional content to this uh, statement, um, but, it, but it is making an argument, okay? So the first step we need to do is sort of um, kind of understand that it's an argument that needs some translation. And then also in terms of, of biases, we also have to understand probably just looking at this argument, um, some people agree with it, some people disagree with it, with it okay? So for a, a step kind of before we start translating is just to keep an open mind to it. We're gonna test whether this argument is strong or weak. And so one thing we need to do is not judge it before we've gone through this exercise. Okay, so, you know, so with our sort of biases in check, we've got to translate this into more clear, succinct language that we can analyze. Okay, so here's a translation, uh, principles of translation. Again, the book covers in more detail, but, you know, accurate, their accuracy, I must kind of accurately translate what the person originally said. Um, I should treat it charitably, okay? And the test really should be is I should translate in such a way that if I were to show my translation to the person who made the original statement, they would look at it and say, yes, I agree, you captured what I was trying to say. Okay, so in this case, you know, um, there's not a person to show it to, but I'm gonna make the claim that this is an accurate and charitable translation of the original statement. Okay, so now that it's translated, we have to analyze the argument. And I put a line here, so it kind of gives the impression of the kind of premises adding up to the conclusion. And, you know, for those who are not familiar with the terms, in, in an argument, a premise is a statement that in my argument, I am asking you to accept. And the conclusion is saying that if you accept my premises, then in this, in this instance, for this type of argument, you must accept the conclusion. Okay, that's a, a certain kind of argument, and we'll get into details now. But this one, this argument is saying, uh, this, t this argument will be valid if, and only if, the accepting the premises requires you to accept the conclusion. Okay, so the first step is to accept the premises, right? And in, in this case, we, we, we don't apply any skepticism to the premises, we just accept them as true. This is a temporary, is a, a temporary state where we're gonna accept that premise one, our social distancing practices have been in place for a month. And premise two, during that month, the number of death and deaths has gone up. We're gonna accept those are true. And then we're gonna ask ourselves, if we accept those as true, are we forced to accept the conclusion? Okay, that harsh social distancing practices are not stopping the spread of coronavirus. And the answer in this case is obviously, no, we don't have to accept the conclusion, right? Nobody said social distancing practices will work immediately. In fact, they said very clearly that this is gonna take time. Okay, so if an argument, you can accept the premises and reject the conclusion for this type of, of an argue, deductive argument, then that argument is not valid, okay? And if it's, an argument is not valid, the argument fails. Now, there is a way we could have made our original argument valid, okay? We could have added what's called a hidden premise because sort of baked into that original argument, the original statement is actually a premise that's not stated outright, okay? But it actually is implied in the argument. And I 
I have sort of distilled it out. I've extracted that out. Hidden in that original argument was a premise that social distancing practices should lead to an immediate reduction in the deaths of coronavirus. Okay, so now I have three premises. Leading, the first two are the same as the original, but I've got my new hidden premise and I've got the conclusion. And I think in this case, you could see this is now a valid argument, right? To try it yourself, accept the three premises. And again, if, even if there's a premise in there, you are not inclined to believe at this point, you should temporarily accept all three as true and then see if you have to accept the conclusion. In this case, you do. If you accept all three premises as true, then you must accept the conclusion as true. Okay, so this version of the argument is valid, but there's another test of an argument's quality, which is the test of soundness. And if, if you had to temporarily accept all the premises as true, the test of soundness, you know, that the, you are no longer required to do so. You could test each premise for its tru truth or falsehood. Uh, and, you know, as we said before, premise one and premise two, those are actually easy to accept. Those are statements of fact, okay? But uh, premise three is easy to reject, okay? Premise three is easy to reject. And if even one premise fails in this type of deductive argument, then the entire argument is unsound. Okay, so a couple of things just to sort of point out, you know, in this version of the argument, when I had two premises, notice that premises are true, right? Both premises in this case are true, but the conclusion's false. Okay, this is sort of demonstrating um, that, you know, we, we talk a lot about fact checking, we must sort of check, check the, and fact checking is great, fact checking is very, very important, but fact checking in this case would just do what fact checking always does, which is show that the premises of an argument are true, but in order to check the argument as a whole, you must also check the logic, which we just did going through this methodology. Okay, and, um, you know, I should note that um, in addition to, you know, the, the, the book, I've got a uh, project called Logic Check, which I, I can uh, bring up some examples of that. This has a number of other examples, very similar to what I was uh, showing you before, where the sort of rules of logic are applied to um, sort of, of new, news affairs that people want to kind of learn more. Some people were asking about, um, people, some people were asking about uh, kind of learning online. There's a sort of curriculum associated with this. And then actually, um, you know, my son is going to be learning these subjects in a, in a series of blog posts at this Degree of Freedom site. So you can follow along and learn that, learn that as well. Okay, so, um, uh, so, so that is an example of um, putting the critical thinking into action, okay? And that can, that's just one example, okay? You know, on that sort of logic check site I mentioned, it's applied to the presidential primaries, it's applied to, to international politics. But, you know, fake news, what is fake news except the inability to filter and analyze the quality of information that we're receiving from news sources increasing online? Um, political demagogues, right, all the time, they'll do what you just saw in that argument, that um, they will sort of use true premises to sort of prop up a, a untrue conclusion, right? So uh, that, that sort of demonstrates we need more than fact checking. We need to be able to sort of understand the reasoning and the arguments we're given. Uh, political polarization, right? What people are talking before, we're talking more about dispositions. That's really about giving into our biases and not pr practicing critical, dis critical thinking dispositions. Um, these are the things that sort of have led to kind of many of the, the problems, you know, many of our political crisis now sort of, you know, many of the challenges we have dealing with a sort of global pandemic are not, not kind of exhibiting these sort of important dispositions. But, you know, e even personal decisions like, you know, where to go to college, what car to buy, um, you know, even sort of interpersonal interactions. Um, these are all things that would be improved through kind of systematic reasoning. And, you know, that's really where, you know, the kind of book ends with a set of, of recommendations, and I'll just sort of sum them up here, and then we can leave plenty of time for QA. But, you know, one is, you know, as you can imagine, a lot of the recommendations focus on education um, and really kind of reforming education to integrate those high leverage critical thinking practices I talked about across all disciplines. I mean, as I said, the good news is we don't have to dismantle the existing curriculum, nor do we even need to sort of like be teaching critical thinking all the time. There's certain high leverage content areas where these sort of high leverage practices can be applied. 
teachers need to be trained how to do this. We need to kind of make it a priority, but it can be done. You know, we've seen bigger educational reforms happen in our lifetime. This is something that uh, can make a difference, even if it's just the difference in a, in a different classroom. But I think it's something that can be done sort of, of, of across the board if there's enough sort of, of interest and will. Um, second, you know, we talked about raising children to become critical thinkers. This is really gets back to those dispositions. I think um, um, homes where sort of, you know, dogmatic beliefs reign and people aren't allowed to sort of question things. We need to kind of recognize those as what they are. Those are breaks on our children's future success. Okay, so there's uh, reasons even in places where um, families hold strong beliefs, which is, as I said, a perfectly reasonable thing to do, that they are still open to having those beliefs sort of discussed and, and, and challenged. Uh, and finally, this is more aspirational, but I, I you know, can't help but believe in a society where we kind of celebrate athletic prowess and raw intelligence on game shows like Jeopardy, you know, sort of memory, that we can't find some way to sort of celebrate people putting knowledge to work, you know, kind of celebrating and exposing what sort of what they're doing when they think critically about a subject. So those are my three hopes. And, um, you know, I'm really sort of, of excited to sort of kick things off today with uh, this book and this discussion. So, um, Anna, I guess we'll sort of use the uh, time left, which I'm glad there's plenty of it for some more Q&A. Yeah, well, we definitely have a lot of questions. Um, the first one is, in order to become a critical thinking society, will we all have to become Mr. Spock? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually I'm glad you asked that. For, for the few non-Star Trek fans out there, or a classic track, this was, uh, Mr. Spock was from planet Vulcan. I know that was a planet that allegedly was committed entirely to logic. Although if you watch the old Trek series, you actually never see Vulcans doing like any sort of logical proofs or anything. Uh, what they really do in, in, in Planet Vulcan is they suppress emotion. They suppress the things that supposedly interfere with reasoning. And, you know, with all due respect to Sirach, founder of the Vulcan way of life, uh, that's a mistake, I would say, you know, and that's a mistake because emotion and instinct, which are often seen as enemies of reason, because, you know, when we act unreasonably, it's often because we let our emotions get the better of us. And that's perfectly, you know, valid concern. But emotions are also a source of data, right? When my I think of parenting when my children were small before they could talk to me. I, I knew when they were hungry, I knew when they were happy, sad, hungry, tired. I knew that because of the emotional connection of the love I had for them. And that provided sort of data for me that I could use to make decisions. Now those decisions needed to be more Spock-like as to kind of what to do when, but cutting yourself off from emotion means cutting yourself off from emotional connection with people. When you're critically thinking about most important subjects, you're critically thinking about things involving other people. So, um, so emotion shouldn't get the better of us, but nor should data we get through our emotions be ignored. Um, same thing with instinct, right? Trust is a, is a very valid instinct and um, we should uh, kind of uh, listen to it, right? Um, these, these are things that, um, you know, don't, they, they, that while, you know, sort of, tribal, you know, trust can become sort of tribalism, emotions can be sort of, you know, um, good or bad. These can all interfere with reason, but at the same time, it, it doesn't mean they have to, right? The good emotions, love, caring, concern, um, sort of connections with other people. Um, these are all sort of the sources of the premises in your arguments. And so you have to vet them, vet the quality of that data, as with any argument. But then you have to sort of apply sort of logical reasoning to uh, kind of get to um, kind of make the right decisions, get to an answer. So yes, and you know, just sort of highlight, um, you know, one, but I like to point out Mr. Spock, you know, for all his, his great strength and intellect was never the captain of the Enterprise. You know, the captain of the Enterprise has always been somebody who balanced, uh, balanced their, uh, their logic and their emotion. Um, so no need to turn into Planet of Vulcan. Great. So we have a lot more questions. And since we're near the end, I'm going to try to ask them all. Um, so can you say anything about how to talk with someone who has already decided an opinion and can't be swayed by facts once the opinion is formed? Do you find that offering empathy and active listening can help? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you just sort of, 
think about yourself. Think about the last time you changed your mind over an important thing. Um, you know, probably it was not because, you know, somebody argued, argued you out of it. You know, um, somebody arguing you, with you may have gotten you thinking about changing your mind about something, but then you reflected, you know, probably more privately, uh, possibly, you know, sort of communicating to the person who sort of had given you a convincing argument, but in a more sort of like empathetic setting. So I, I think we just have to sort of presume, you know, nobody changes their mind because you kind of defeat them in a Twitter war or, you know, sort of, of shout them or, or shame them. There's a, a author, Jay Heinrichs, who wrote a, a book called Thank You for Arguing, which makes a distinction between an argument and a fight. Okay, and an argument is a constructive endeavor. You know, with an argument, you're trying to convince somebody to change their mind about something. Whereas in a fight, you just want to get them to do what you, you know, do what you want them to do. And I'd say, you know, um, if you're really trying to kind of convince people, then you need to be sort of open-minded to their opinions. One, because they might be right and you might be wrong, but also because even if you're right um, and you're sure you're right and you really feel this need to convince somebody um, to change their mind, they're, they're not gonna do it uh, just by sort of whipping them in debate, right? They'll, they'll do it with um, understanding, kind of empathy, maybe sharing opinion, and you know, in many situations, it may turn out that uh, you're both you're both right, right? The answer to the particular question you're looking for is um, um, somewhere in between, or you might have diametrically opposed uh, ways of getting to to solve a common problem, right? A simple example I like to use is you know somebody who says you know we need to help the poor by increasing welfare uh, benefits, for example, and someone who says, you know, the poor benefit from, you know, being independent and, you know, welfare creates dependency, right? Those seem like diametrically opposed positions, but in fact, they're both involved in a common mission, helping the poor, right? They have completely different ways of getting there. One might be right, one might, one might be wrong, or one might be right in certain situations, the other right in other situations, but um, I think both sides recognizing that they're on a common mission and the states to help the poor makes the difference between them um, less harsh, right? Where if you're on a cooperative enterprise together, then even if you end up you know, never agreeing, at least it turns out you did agree on what the common mission is. Okay, great. So here's another question. Um, it wants in what sense is persuasive argumentation a component of critical thinking and how does it differ from sophistry? Uh-huh, this is a philosopher asking this question, I'm sure. <laughs> there are lots Cause... of philosophers out there today, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, I'm glad you're fielding the questions then. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is a biggie because uh, for, for those of you who don't know, sophistry refers to the sophists who were itinerant teachers in ancient Athens who would teach people how to make bad arguments seem stronger. Or they, they would teach basically rhetoric, persuasive communication skills. And, you know, Socrates uh, hated the sophists. And in fact, you know, the, the philosophy was sort of taken as the enemy of, of, of sophistry. And, and, you know, with good reason, because philosophy is the quest for truth. You know, sophistry is a sort of quest to convince people regardless of the truth. That's the idea of, you know, someone who can make the stronger arguments seem, or the weaker arguments seem the stronger. The reason, the reason I included in the sort of critical thinking kit, um, even though I know, you know, it's sort of not only do, you know, some philosophers object to it, but also they're sort of, of um, separated topics that often rhetoric might be taught in English, English class and um, kind of, of logic taught in a philosophy class is that, you know, well, as I said before, you often have to peer through the rhetoric in order to see the logic below. And if, you're, if you don't know what the rhetoric is, if you don't know what you're looking for, it's hard to sort of like peel it away. So I think that's one benefit. I think another one, as I said, is if your arguments are strong, you know, they're logical, they're valid, they're sound, ideally moral, um, there's no reason that using some of the persuasive techniques that uh, fall under the category of rhetoric can't be used to make your powerful moral arguments unstoppable. Okay, so I think there's a value to that. And I guess the other piece kind of gets to, you know, things that um, 
the ancients didn't know as well as we did, which is how our how our brains work, right? We are very much um, kind of of um, emotional as well as reasonable beings. And as modern cognitive science showed, even our reasoning is not as uh, foolproof as we thought it was, right? We used to think that it's our reason that separates us from um, kind of lower animals. But in fact, our reasoning has flaws. There are biases. There are sort of both, uh, we take shortcuts called heuristics that sort of both lead us to errors, okay? So I'd say, you know, generally understanding persuasive techniques, these days especially, they involve understanding when people are trying to take advantage of these flaws in our reasoning. Um, and so I, I will stick with the notion that, um, you know, understanding uh, certain aspects of the rhetorical tradition is valuable as a critical thinker, but it's no substitute for, um, for understanding logic. I think rhetoric absent sort of the other skills is, is sophistry. And so on that, on that front, I would agree with, with the question commenter. Great. So here's um, an important education question to get into that field. Um, in your opinion, what is the role of librarians in working with faculty and other educators in teaching critical thinking? Uh, well, one clear role um, is, is um, and you know, this is someone who's, who's Mom is a librarian, and uh, um, you know, so I've been involved when library, when li what library science sort of emerged as a kind of very vital field, especially as libraries move from primarily collections of sort of books and manuscripts to really sort of information centers, where sort of librarians have kind of reinvented their field as information specialists. So, so one area I think librarians are already they don't have to get them, but they're already at the forefront of it is sort of information literacy. You know, all the aspects of sort of, of information literacy is a field that emerged from library science. And as I talked before about uh, background knowledge in today's world, much of that background knowledge is going to come from online sources. Okay, it's going to come from the internet, it's going to come from online media. And um, I'm sort of of, of you know, pointing out that the, the skills needed to sort of, of sort uh, quality from high, high from low quality information comes from um, um, internet or information sources. So librarians teaching sort of information literacy is one area. So I know libraries often will give courses to incoming freshmen to college libraries. Um, you know, I know um, people involved with projects like Big Six, which is a, a technique for teaching uh, information literacy to lower grades. Um, I know librarians involved with that. So I'd say, you know, that's sort of a big aspect of it. I'd say if librarians can sort of, just like teachers understand the whole critical thinking process as I kind of outlined it, then they would understand their role of ensuring people have the highest quality premises in their arguments. Great, so two more questions, I believe. Um, one question, are there any cultural characteristics that affect critical thinking around the world? For example, in Asian cultures or Western cultures or in Latin America? Uh, you know, this, I gotta say, I don't know enough of, um, you know, for instance, the, the, um, uh, philosophical traditions in all the other lands, you know, but I, would say, you know, that the time kind of Socrates was doing his thing turned out to have been as a sort of explosion of intellectual activity across the world. That's, you know, around the same time uh, Confucius was sort of coming up with, with his teachings in, in um, China. Also when uh, sort of, of Hindu and Buddhist sort of philosophy was, was sort of sprouting. So, you know, I would say um, areas that we, in, in you know, Western philosophy refer to as sort of metaphysics, you know, logics, those, you know, uh, uh, ethics kind of rules to live by, uh, those kind of things can be found in all cultures. Um, I think, you know, one thing we probably need to be cognizant of is, you know, the, when I listed the sort of traditions that are tapped into to sort of create critical thinking, right, you know, philosophy, science, uh, psychology, many of those sort of emerged in, um, in, in the West, in particularly in Western Europe, and as I noted, critical thinking itself is was conceived of by, in America. You know, so I think we have to sort of be open to the notion that um, 
these uh, that that other traditions have you know important things to teach us other forms of logic we should be sort of, of exploring and looking at but we should also sort of um, kind of be open to the question is principles you know like logic or rhetoric are they um, necessarily kind of of inventions of just one culture or are they sort of discoveries that many cultures have come up with and are sort of universal to to humanity so I'd say you know kind of of being recognizing the fact that you know some of these these principles have emerged from a distinct culture but also appreciate the fact that I think there's no corner of the world where people are not sort of discussing debating arguing um, you know have with with systems of reasoning that are part of their sort of philosophical and cultural tradition great so one last question um, oh, let me pull it back up So it seems that critical thinking has gained interest in recent years in the education field and among parents. What has driven us? Well, you know, there was a big bang moment in the 80s uh, when a group of critical thinking activists um, convinced the University of California system to make a critical thinking course a requirement for graduation. And that really sort of put kind of critical thinking much higher on the map. That's why, you know, a lot of critical thinking textbooks sort of came into existence then to support courses that were being developed to, to meet that requirement and courses that it inspired around other universities around the country. Now, it turns out, you know, there was hope that this would sort of spread across the country, if not the world, and there'd be critical thinking courses taught everywhere. That, that ended up not happening. And, you know, as it turns out that um, standalone critical thinking courses may not be the best way to teach the subject anyway, but that sort of galvanized things. I think then you also had in that same decade the um, kind of beginning of the accountability movement and the standards and accountability movement. And again, I'm talking about the U.S., but you had similar things overseas um, where you had sort of new modern academic standards in each discipline. And if you look at standards like the Common Core or some of the modern standards for science and social studies that are, are being used in states in the U.S., they are very, um, uh, pri very big on prioritizing critical thinking principles. You could look at some Common Core ELA standards. They look like they could come out of a uh, syllabus for a, for a college level critical thinking course. Um, so, so I think, you know, what we've done is we've prioritized it and we talk about it. I think I mentioned, you know, surveys indicate 99% of, of teachers and college professors claim, you know, teaching kids to think critically is one of their top priorities. Um, but they also claim that you know, employers claim, you know, 75% of employers claim that the graduates that they hire after 12, 16 years of school don't have those skills. Right. So the good news is it doesn't mean we, we don't have an account. We don't have an enthusiasm gap. Right. There's no teachers. Like there's nobody saying I, I don't I hate critical thinking. Critical thinking is ridiculous. We shouldn't do it. You know, um, they all want to do it. And many of them think they're already doing it, but they're doing it through these sort of immersion techniques and to a certain extent, even the sort of standalone courses that aren't as effective as possible. So I think what we've we've sort of moved the needle in terms of interest, excitement, enthusiasm. So now it's a question of how do we refine techniques? How do we take teachers who are already, you know, skilled and knowledgeable at top, about topics much more complicated than these critical thinking, high leverage practices I mentioned, you know, any biology teacher knows a much bigger not body of knowledge than is required to sort of add critical thinking to the mix. But how do we add that to their mix? How do we train them? not just on the field, but how to integrate that into what they're, what they're teaching, where to do it, what are those high, high leverage areas. So that's sort of the next mission is to um, kind of, of make it more part of the sort of practical implementation of education. Um, you know, its origin, as I said, it's been around kind of for, the enthusiasm has been around for decades. Now, now we just have to do something about it. That's really kind of the main reason I wrote the book. Great, thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, tell us a little bit more about where we can find out more about this topic. Okay, well, uh, you know, to begin with, you can, um, now let me share again. Uh, you know, to begin with, um, you know, some of the uh, kind of sites I gave you a quick peek at before, um, 
that a degree of freedom is really, that, that's where, um, you know, I mentioned that sort of, of blog where my son will be learning critical thinking skills, you could follow along, but that also uh, includes material on this book on critical thinking generally. Um, it also includes some educator resources I've created uh, for teaching online during the coronavirus. So if anybody is doing so, there's some information there I hope you find helpful. Also the Logic Check uh, site. Um, so these are resources that so you could tap into to learn more as well as, of course, read the book. And uh, you can reach me at uh, this email address. Um, and uh, obviously you could learn more about the book at uh, MIT Press. Great. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, and just to remind everyone there, um, of course, please go to the website and read the book if you want to learn more. Um, but we also are having another event next Tuesday at the same time at 12.30 p.m. Um, with Anissa Ramirez, author of The Alchemy Bus. So if you want to join us for our next call, um, feel free to join us there. And of course, if you want to learn anything else about the MIT Press or any of our other books, you can go to mitpress.mit.edu. Anyway, thank you so much for speaking with us today, Jonathan. I feel like it was really informative and um, hopefully we all know a little bit more about critical thinking now. Well, thanks so much, Anna, and uh, everybody at the press and everybody for showing up. I really appreciate your questions and the conversation and uh, you know how to reach me. So please, uh, let's keep it going. Keep the dialogue going. Thanks so much. All right, great. Thank you.